Well, today I think we're going to be in for a good discussion. We're actually going to be talking about something that uh, is very close to my heart. Um, I think I told you a little bit about it uh, last week, um, if you were with us last week. Um, and so we're continuing on in our study of the book of Acts, and particularly and specifically, we are continuing our look in uh, Acts chapter 20 where Paul is speaking and giving his farewell address, if you want to call it that, uh, to the Ephesian elders in Miletus. And I think uh, what I had said last time, um, and the theme that we're going to continue to see, um, is that uh, I think what Paul is trying to communicate to these, to these people is the importance of staying the course when it comes to ministry and executing what the Lord has called you to do. Okay, so, and I want to remind you, that even though these are spoken to elders, the whole the name of the game behind this whole thing is setting an example. So Paul is setting an example for these these Ephesian elders. And I think that as as we look at the ministry of elders, I think the one thing that we have to understand is that elders are to be examples to the flock so that they can follow that example. Okay. And so as people, um, everybody who is named uh under Christ, um, as we are uh, as we are, are connected with Christ, the one thing that we have to understand is that all of us, to a certain extent, are ministers. It might not be vocational ministry, and some of the things that we talk about um, having to do with ministry is relegated to just that arena. Um, but we also have to keep other things in mind, too. It's just as some of the things that can be gleaned um, from ministry as a whole, all around, uh, that involves everybody in the church. Um, so... Um, we're going to look at a short range of verses. I don't think we're going to finish up chapter 20 today, um, but uh, we'll definitely finish it up next time, I think. But um, but I want to spend a little bit a little bit of time on a few verses, starting where we left off last time and uh, seeing, seeing what we can what we can extract from that. I think that there are some very important things um, that we can talk about and what, that we can draw from this. If this is your first time um, with this podcast, welcome. I would encourage you to stay with us. Um, I, I believe that there, that there are some useful things to glean no matter when you come into the program or when you discover this program. Um, so I would encourage you to stay tuned um, and everybody else listening to this to stay tuned. I think we're in for some good things. My name is Steve Gill, and you are listening to Loving the Scriptures. If you've, if you've listened to this program um, faithfully for a while now, this, this program is, is relatively new. I mean, it's, I, we got started uh, here at Loving the Scriptures um, back in uh, 2017, um, I believe it was in July. So we have been, um, we've been doing Loving the Scriptures here for um, a little over a year and a half. And um, in the earlier part of, of, of this, of the show, um, if you've been with us for that long a time, if you've been faithfully listening, and I don't know who has or who hasn't or whatever, but if you have, you may remember um, and this would have been just a few weeks uh, after after loving the scripture started. I did a a two episode uh, uh, discussion on how to honor your pastors. Um, I believe. Um, let me think here, because uh, I don't have the information in front of me. But I now that I think about it, I, if you haven't listened to that, I would refer you to that. Um, uh, I believe the episodes are episodes 13 and 14, either 13 or 14 or 14 and 15. I, I like I said, I don't have it up on my screen, um, right now. And, you know, just as long as you know, the general area, I think you'll, I think you'll be okay. Um, but it's, it was a, it was a whole discussion on how to honor your pastors. It was, I did it in October, um, just kind of as a, as a whole thing of pastor appreciation month and everything. Um, and uh, you know, some of the things that I mentioned there um, had to do with w ways that we may not honor our pastors. And this is kind of weird for me speaking about this now, because now, unlike before, when I, when I recorded those episodes, now I am in the position of elder and I am in the position of pastor. I am now an ordained pastor. I, I don't think I mentioned that before. I'll mention it to you now. I am uh, an ordained pastor. I'm not a senior pastor uh, at the church that I'm at, but I am a pastor. Um, and, uh, you know, so it wasn't as weird maybe saying some of the things that I said when I recorded the things on how to honor your pastor back then because I wasn't in that arena. Now I am, um, you know, 
you know, so maybe you understand where, where the weirdness might come in when I'm, when I'm, when I'm talking about things like this. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that I, that I majored on, um, and this was specifically in the, in the second part, like I said, it was, it was a two part discussion. And I think more of this came out in the, in, in the second part, part two, um, of just how we expect pastors to do so much. And there are a lot of things I believe where pastors are doing things or pastors are expected to do things that they're not even called to do, not even equipped to do. Um, it's just this whole thing of, okay, since the pastor or pastors are leader or is the leader or leaders of the church, then they are, then they do this and they do this and they do this and this and this and this and this. And there's this long list of stuff. They have to be the head or the chairman of every committee that's in existence, um, in the church. And, um, you know, and if you, if you remember that episode, if you've listened to that before, or if you haven't, you go back and you go back and you listen to it. Um, I think you'll, I think, Part, you'll you'll get a sense of a little bit of the frustration that comes from out of my out of my tone just as I'm talking about some of those things because listen it it is a reality I, I hate to say it but it is a reality where there are so much so many things that are expected of um, a pastor where they're not they're there's expectations for them to be responsible for certain things when they're biblically they're not responsible for those sorts of things. And if those expectations aren't met, then they get criticism. Now, listen, I've I've actually, I've experienced this now, um, and it didn't take long, um, you know, receiving you know just kind of a little bit of, of of criticism for you should have organized this and and done this, you know that's you know that's part of your thing as being a leader, and you know I don't have to go into the details of the of the situation or the discussion, but I mean I I, I explain. Listen, that's. That's not what a pastor does. That's not what an elder does. Um, and even and, and even so, the thing that was being complained about wasn't even something that was initiated or led by the leadership. It was led by somebody in the congregation who stood up and said, hey, I would like to do this. Can we can we put this together? I would love to lead this and do this. And we said and they said, you know, go for it. That's that's great. And I think uh, the end result, everybody had a great time. But uh, you know, it, it wasn't even something that that the leadership was in charge of um, is the is the ironic thing. Um, but um, but, uh, you know, I for so long I've seen I've heard, I've just been in a position of hearing from other pastors what that's like. Now I've kind of I've, I've kind of experienced it myself and it wasn't something where somebody was beating me up over this uh, over this sort of thing. I don't want to give that sort of impression, nor do I want to create a whole thing where say, woe is me, you know, you know that, that that's not that's not the issue here. But now having stepped into that arena, um, you know, I've I've kind of gotten a little bit again, just a little bit. Um, and I'm sure that there's more of this to come in the years ahead as I continue on in this course. Uh, I've, I've experienced a little bit of what that is now. Um, and listen, I was I was one who with gentleness, you know, had to explain, listen, that's if that's what you're expecting of an elder or a pastor or whatever like that, you have to understand that's not that's not biblically what we're what we're all about. That's not what we're called to do. It's that's not our responsibility. Um and so, you know, it's just those things of just having to explain to people um, biblically what being an elder slash pastor or whatever, what that's what that's all about. A good place to go for that, by the way, is, is the book of First Timothy. And and one of the things that I that I've uh, I still cling to this in my mind um, is that, Lord willing, if if the door is ever open for me to uh, be a lead pastor at a at a church somewhere, um, you know, coming into this, unless the Lord diverts me in another direction, what I intend to do is, is, um, start off, um, by, uh, by preaching through the book of first Timothy, um, you know, just so the congregation is aware biblically what is expected of me and also biblically what's expected of them and of the entire church. Um, I think that says, I, I think that going on that and starting from there, you're, you're, uh, in a good position to get started off on the right foot so that everybody knows what the expectations are. And these aren't expectations that, that I'm making up or just inventing out of my own head. It's, it's the whole thing of, okay, let's go to scripture and see what it actually says. Okay. And so that's, and I, 
it's my desire to get off on the right foot in that particular context that would lead me to uh, preach through several weeks through the book of First Timothy. Um, now, the book of First Timothy isn't the only place where you can where you can see or talk or or discover what the Bible says about what elders are to do or what their responsibility is. Um, you know, and and what we're going to look at here in the book of Acts is is one of those areas. Um, and so, and it's so, and listen, this is so important. You know, the words that Paul lays out here is very, very important. Okay. And, um, and I want us to, to capture this. Okay. Um, like I said, the theme here, um, that we, that we started to talking about last time, and we'll go into a little bit, a little bit of review here in a minute. Uh, but you know, just talking about this whole thing of staying the course, um, and the whole thing of staying the course can uh, can be seen in two different views. I think we saw one of those last time, and we're going to see another perspective today. Um, the, la- the 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 one perspective last time, as far as staying the course, is staying the course uh, in ministry when you know that things when there's trouble ahead. And Paul used himself as an example, and I think that Paul lays himself forth as an example. In a, and so that in sort of an indirect way, telling the Ephesian elders, look, this is, you know, if this is happening to me, you, you can be sure that this is something that's going to happen to you as you continue to minister. And so Paul uses himself as an example, um, you know, talking about the, the tears that he shed and the hardships and, and things like that. But um, particularly, and, and this is where I want to really draw your attention, um, is um, in verse 22 and following and again, we looked at this last time where he, where Paul says, and now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Now, again, like I mentioned last time, he's not saying that pr- imprisonment awaits me in every city, um, but he's saying that the Holy Spirit in every city that he goes to, the Holy Spirit continues to warn him that down the line there's going to be imprisonment um, awaiting him, imprisonment and affliction and everything. Um, and so we we've seen if you've been with us through our study of the Book of Acts, and we, as we've looked at the ministry of Paul, started from its very beginning. Um, not even from the beginning of his first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13, but even before then, um, we see the afflictions that, that Paul has had to go through um, and the persecution that he's had to suffer. Now, that's not a whole thing of just an Apostle Paul thing. You know, other people have suffered the same thing as well. And we've talked about that um, before um, in our study of the book of Acts as well. Um, but that those are the things that he had to experience. So we, we've seen affliction and imprisonment and let me clarify the whole thing of imprisonment because I, I I feel it's necessary because what I had said last time was that we hadn't seen Paul you know really hit that up to this point um, in chapter 20 of imprisonment but let me clarify because we have seen Paul behind bars right we saw him behind bars in Philippi um, in Acts chapter 16 um, and so you know I, I should have clarified this before um, you know, Paul has been in prison before. What we're dealing with there was just a very brief imprisonment. Because if you remember, uh, the foundation shook, all the doors were open, the shackles were broken. Paul was set free. He didn't run away, but he used that time to preach to the Philippian jailer who came to know the Lord. And then following that, um, the Philippian jailer's household. Um, and then the next day, Paul was let go. So it was a very brief um, uh, imprisonment uh, where he was behind bars. Um, so he see he's seen jail time before but i guess what I, what i'm really trying to get at here is that we haven't seen paul in a prolonged sort uh, uh, in a prolonged period of captivity and i think that's really what the holy spirit is warning him about and what we are actually going to see pretty much uh, you know once we hit chapter 21 and into chapter 22 uh, we're going to see through the rest of the book um, once we get to that point where Paul is arrested in Jerusalem, uh, the rest of the time in the in the book of Acts that we see the Apostle Paul, he's going to be in chains. And then when he makes it to Rome, he's going to be under house arrest. And we le- the book of Acts leaves Paul in captivity. Now, outside of the book of Acts, we, we know and we understand that, that Paul was released. Later on, he was arrested again and he was imprisoned. That, and that imprisonment would lead... 
um, up to his uh, um, well, up to his execution, which uh, Paul sees coming um, in um, in uh, in Second Timothy chapter four. Um, so uh, so yeah, so just wanted to clarify that you know just kind of set the record straight on that. Um, the, the, I think I believe the thing that that Paul is being warned warned about mostly from the Holy Spirit, um, aside from afflictions, the imprisonment is uh, the long term imprisonment that he would that he would uh, that we would have to suffer, um, which we're leading into just as we as we continue to go through the Book of Acts and as we're slowly but surely coming to uh, the book's conclusion, um, we're kind of at that last quarter, approaching that last quarter of the book. Where we read about uh, where we read about that sort of thing, um, but so that's what that's what he's been warned about. But then again, but again, um, what we saw in in, uh, in verse twenty four, he says, "But I account, but I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I finish my course and the and the ministry that I received from the from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God." Okay, so. There and the and the whole thing of there that I, that I underlined there last time, and I just want to make a brief reminder of there is the whole thing of, of if only I may finish my course. Paul wanted to be one who at the end at the end of his time was able to say I did everything that the Lord set forth for me to do as it related to what he uh, what he wanted me to do ministry wise. And that's the tone that Paul uh, that Paul had um, in Second Timothy chapter four. I believe we looked at that last time. Where he says, "I've finished the race. I've kept the face. Uh, kept, uh, I've kept the faith." That's something that you're going to want to be able to say when everything is all said and done, right? That's 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 what you that's what you want to be able to say. You want to be able to have that mindset where you can say, "All right, I've come to the end here. This is it." And so now, you know, I can I can I can leave with no regrets because I finished the course that that God has laid forth for me. So that's so that's kind of where what you have there. So we we use I think I use the term single mindedness also single mindedness single mindedness of purpose uh, for Paul um, that translates into him staying the course. Um, you know, just even in the midst of threats of persecution and even in the midst of persecution. Again, we've seen that kind of outlaid um, in um, in uh, in other parts uh, uh, in in uh, Paul's journeys. And we've seen in the book of Acts, um, you know, so he's he we talked a little bit more about, um, you know, how he's innocent of, of, of everybody's blood. And because of verse 27, he says, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And so this kind of leads into, I, I believe, what we're going to continue to see in verse 28. I mean, obviously, verse 27 going into verse 28, obviously they're connected. But um, with Paul as a as a as setting himself as an example I think the fact that he says that he didn't shrink back from from uh, from preaching the whole from teaching the whole counsel of God is very key, um, you know, because I mean, it, it kind of goes along the lines of um, of what Paul uh, uh, encourages and, and charges Timothy to do in Second Timothy chapter four uh, to preach the, to preach the word in season and out of season when it's popular and when it's not popular. Whatever the spiritual environment is, when the Lord opens your mouth to speak, you speak, even if it's not popular for a lot of people. And we know that's kind of been a theme for a lot of people who have been who have been God's people. I mean, even in the Old Testament, you think that the prophets of the Old Testament spoke and said things in times when what they were saying was very popular. Absolutely not. Okay, you know, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you know, God even warned Ezekiel. Um, that he's going to say things to people who are very hardened in their hearts, um, you know. So, uh, you know, this is this is sort of the, sort of the thing. And so Paul, you know, said, "I wasn't one who shrunk away from from uh, from communicating to you the whole counsel of God." And so we kind of went into a discussion um, of that. Um, again, this is kind of part two of this whole thing of staying the course. So, if you want a fuller explanation and a, and a fuller um, discussion on that. Um, look at last episode. Um, listen to last episode um, to get all of that. But now we we're, we're 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 picking up where we left off here, and the and the verses of interest here um, that I, that I want to look at um, is verses uh, twenty eight through through thirty one. 
Okay, so this is what it says here in verse 28. It says, pay, uh, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you, everyone with tears. So in those few verses, there's a lot there. And that's why I'm, I'm saying we're probably not going to, to finish up chapter 20 um, this time, but we probably will next time. And, and that's OK. Uh, but I really want to be able to have an opportunity to say what I need to say about this now. As I'm saying, as I'm explaining some of these things, that you know, the uh, some of the things I may be saying to uh, pastors, if you're a pastor who are listening, and then other things uh, being sent to congregations and something. I mean, yeah, I, it, it's yeah, it it, it just it, it, there's certain things I think that'll that'll be particularly relevant to either one side or the other, or perhaps even both. But I mean, it's whatever the case, both sides should listen up to this. Um, because I think that just within those few verses there, you get a very good understanding of the importance, um, of the position of elders, or even, you know, if you want to use the word pastors, the, the word in the Greek here is, uh, pres, uh, presbyteros, uh, which, you know, we get the word presbyter from, you know, the whole thing, uh, between a, a presbyter and an elder, you know, that, that, that term in the, in the Greek, when you read it in the new Testament, you know, it's, you can kind of see it interchangeably there. Um, but that's the kind of the operative word that you that you get from the original language. Um, and so that's the word that's used here. And, um, you know, with Paul talking to these Ephesian elders and, and again, remember, remember the setting here, uh, Paul um, and he and he says this. Um, uh, where does he say this here? Um, did we already? Did we already? Yeah, we already covered this. This was something from last time. Remember what he said um, in uh, verse 25. He says, and now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. So remember, this is this is Paul's last hurrah with these with these with these guys. And so he wants to make sure to tell them the things that they need to know, because in his mind, this is it. And they're not going to see each other again, just based on where Paul believes the Lord is leading him. Um, you know, it, it's 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 going to be very hard, if not impossible, for him to get back to see them again. Um, plus, with the with the threat looming that there's going to be trouble ahead and affliction and imprisonment, that again even even swells the the possibility even more of them not seeing each other again. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, and so with this there, he's saying some very important things. And so in verse 28 through 31, after laying forth him, himself as an example of staying the course, he continues to give forth examples of another area of staying the course. Now, staying the course, as we saw last time, we saw that from the, from the perspective of, um, of, of, of single-mindedness in the midst of persecution and affliction and in, with the threat of persecution looming ahead. With the threat of persecution looming ahead, it can be very easy for somebody to say, well, you know, I'll just I'll just stop here then, even though the Lord's marching orders are pretty clear. Paul says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go and I'm going to finish the course that the Lord has laid forth for me. Now, what we see here, I think we look at this from a perspective of the rise of false teachers or ravenous wolves or fierce wolves as the as the as the language is used here. And the the word the word picture here is very is very helpful, and it's not it's not by any means foreign in scripture, um, but you have the whole picture of of somebody who is a shepherd who looks after uh, after sheep, okay. And and like I said, this isn't a picture that's in, that's anything new. You even read things about this even in the book of Ezekiel, like for example, I want to say chapter thirty four of Ezekiel. I I'm not entirely sure. I think that's I think that's where it is though. Where people who have spiritual authority or spiritual oversight um, look over people, look over other other people, and they are seen as shepherds, uh, shepherds of a flock, a human flock, right? 
Um, even when you think about, uh, even when you think about um, Peter um, in his interaction with the Lord Jesus in John chapter twenty-one, um, when Jesus is, for, you know, pretty much in reinstating Peter after his denial three times, you know, those three times he says, "Feed my lambs" or "Feed my sheep." You know, right? Um, you you have you have that sort of thing. You also have Peter talking about it in First Peter chapter five, being shepherds of God's flock. So you know this and biblically, this is a this is a very uh, favorite word picture, and it's a helpful word picture. Uh, at least it would have been very helpful to to people in that culture. I don't know how much how much we are able to appreciate and grasp the word picture in our day and in our culture uh, in here in the West in the twenty first century. Um, but this was would, this would have been something that would I mean it's not totally lost on us I don't think here in the 21st century but it's I don't think it's as valuable uh, you know as it would have been to the first century audience because that was something that they were very familiar with and they were surrounded by things like this all the time so they knew the whole thing about about you know being shepherd about shepherds and and things and uh, and things along those lines. Um, but you know, you have the whole thing of being, uh, watching over God's flock, um, watching out for ravenous wolves, because we, again, remember that, you know, shepherds were supposed to protect the sheep. They were supposed to protect their sheep from predators. Uh, one of those predators obviously being wolves. You also had lions and bears. That's what David would attest to, um, when recalling his whole thing of being a shepherd. Um, so, you know, the, the shepherd language is, is, is very useful. When it comes to this whole thing of of what an elder or a pastor is supposed to do, okay, and so I, when you capture the 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 importance of this, it is it, I want you to really capture this and compare that to what a lot of people expect their pastors to do. When you line up the two together side by side, you understand that one really doesn't compare to the other, okay. And so you have you have many people in many churches who expect their pastors to to dabble in all these meaningless things. Um, and which when as the more they dabble into these meaningless things, the more they're taken away from what they're really supposed to be doing, which is a, of such great scriptural import. I mean, I, part of me, part of me kind of feels like I don't have enough words to express how important this is. But with the help of the Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my best here. Um, and you know, with the help of, of what's written here in scripture, hopefully, um, the Lord will, will open all of our eyes and open all of our hearts to what Paul is saying in these, in these few verses here. So again, when we look at verse 28, verse 28 itself is jam packed with, with a lot of stuff here. And so we'll, we'll kind of go over it here a little bit here, but, um, in verse 28, uh, notice what he says here. He says, pay very, pay, well, he doesn't say pay very careful, but he says, just says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Okay. Now let's take all of that there because there, verse 28, you, if you want to, if you want to know the honest truth, Verse 28 itself is a whole podcast episode. Um, I don't think I'm going to limit myself to verse 28 just for this time, um, but just so you understand the 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 what's in verse 28 is there's so much in there. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try and be as uh, you know as um, uh, just as brief as I can. Not not too brief. I wanna I wanna get into this a little bit here, um, but. The, Here's one thing that we need to that we need to notice. Now, what we're going to see with, in the words of Paul um, is that there's 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 this emphasis on on uh, on uh, paying attention to God's flock, and that's what I've been what I've been talking about, and and what I've been chomping at the bit of, of talking about, and just laying out that this is this is the dealio when it relates to elders and pastors and things like that of of paying attention looking out for uh looking out for the flock that has been put under their care but i want you to notice something very important here um even before you get to that point the very beginning of verse 28 he says pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock so you notice how that starts out there so those of you who are pastors and elders like myself, listen, listen very close to me. It is very, very important to take heed to what Paul says here. 
And Paul says, you know, pay very careful attention to yourself. So, and I say that because you know, a lot of ministers who might feel burnt out, one of the things that might contribute to that is the fact that they feel that they feel so burdened over everybody else. And, and that's a, that's a good, uh, passionate burden to have for people. But sometimes it's so much to the point where they give everything of themselves to the flock, but they don't do anything for themselves. They don't take care of themselves spiritually. And that's, and that's really the emphasis that we're talking about here is taking care of yourself spiritually. Now, of course, physically, emotionally and stuff that goes into that too. And sometimes that goes by the wayside. Um, but the whole thing of taking care of yourselves. Now I know that some people have testified and I'm just thinking about things that have been said in the past about people, uh, about somebody's pastor where they say our pastor, you know, he's just pulled every which way, you know, they, they, he doesn't really have time to, to have time to himself, to pray to God. And I think that is a huge problem. If you are so busy that you don't even have time for yourself to be alone with God, that's a problem. It's self-defeating too. Um, you know, especially when you're looking at this through the, through the perspective of you need to be an example to the flock. Um, it's very hard to do if you're not taking care of yourself spiritually. Okay. And, and listen, lay people listen up too, because I want this, because again, one of the things that, one of the things that I mentioned with the back, you know, in, in October, 2017, when I talked about the whole thing of how to honor your pastors, one of the things that I said is that you have to be very careful with how much you put on a pastor's plate and you have to, you have to ask the question is what you put on the pastor's plate. Is it biblical? And part of the problems, and listen up pastors and elders, part of the problem is, is that when people shove a lot of things on your plate, things that can be easily delegated to other people in the congregation, there are some people who have problems saying no. And so a simple no would, would go a long way to loosening up somebody's schedule so that they can meet the needs of other people that legitimately falls within their, within their, uh, within their sphere of what they're responsible for. And also being in a position where they can take care of themselves spiritually, um, which is very important. Looking out for your, uh, looking out for, for your own soul and your own commute, uh, uh, you know, communion with God and, 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 and paying attention to your own growth and, and, and understanding what are some of the barriers that are keeping me from growing, for growing in the Lord. And what, and what are some of the things that I, that, um, uh, that I need to get rid of or, or, you know, whatever, as the Lord works with you, just basically what it is, is in, in letting that, that elder take care of themselves is letting them be solid in their, in their relationship with the Lord and allowing themselves to be in a position to grow in their relationship with the Lord and growing in the Lord himself. Because if that's neglected, you know, shepherding, shepherding a a, a flock, a congregation, um, isn't going to do any good. And I can, I can actually see where that could be disastrous down the road. And so Paul, I think, is very deliberate and very careful to, to say, as he lays out in this in this uh, in this verse here, um, to pay pay careful. Now listen, pay careful attention to yourselves and to the and to the flock. Okay, so it starts with it starts with you, pastor, elder, and taking care of yourself. And also, as you're doing that, you take care of the flock. Okay, you take care. Uh, you take care of them. Okay. Now this whole thing of, of, of pay careful attention to, um, you know, what is, what exactly are we, are we talking about here? I mean, basically what we're, what we're, what we, what it comes down to is, is paying careful attention to and guiding and overseeing the souls of the church, the, 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 the spirits, the souls looking for, looking out for people's spiritual well being, their spiritual help and guiding them. And, 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 and primarily the way that this looks I mean, there are two things that I think that, that go into this mainly and primarily. And I say mainly and primarily because you see this show up in other parts of scripture is that number one is through preaching and teaching, right? And, you know, if you look in the pastoral epistle, uh, epistles, uh, specifically in, in the Timothys, um, you see this sort of thing. In First in Timothy chapter 4, uh, Timothy is told to devote himself to the public reading of scripture. In Second Timothy chapter 4, he's charged very solemnly to preach the word and to preach it in season and out of season. This is a very important thing that, that, the, that, that needs to be done 
um, you know, by the by pastors and elders who or, or elders who are in a position to teach. And again, they have to have the ability to teach too. That's that's a that's a qualification uh, that you have that's laid out in First Timothy chapter three. Uh, but the whole thing of preaching and teaching is a, is a very important thing. So that that's something that shows up in Scripture as something that is respons- that is the responsibility of that of that person to to do. Now, you know, and going even going to playing off of what Paul tells Timothy in Second Timothy chapter four, preach the word. OK, and, and I can spend a whole another hour, hour and a half talking about just that one phrase alone. Uh, but I'm just going to be very careful and just be, to be very basic on this uh, on this. Um, I think that 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 preachers need to be ones who draw from Scripture and preach from Scripture. People who are rightly able to divide the word of truth. Right. And that's another that's that's um, uh, that's a term that's that's uh, borrowed from the. Uh, um, from the pastoral officials, that's that's again, that's from Second Timothy. You know, somebody who's able to interpret and to teach those things, and letting that be the primary focus of what you're teaching and what you're preaching. And I say that, you know, some people might hear me say that, and they might say, "Well, isn't that pretty basic?" Well, yes, it is, and it should be. But I think that there's a temptation and a draw to make other things the primary focus of a time of teaching and preaching. Namely, you tell a lot of stories. Now, stories are okay, and people are drawn to stories, but I think some people, in order to pander to what the congregation likes, some people are not so much into preaching from the Word. They might say a few things from the Word, but then like 95, 80, 85, 90% of their, of, their, of their sermon is just stories. And listen, stories are great, but we need, we need meat from the Scripture, and we need an explanation of what what scripture says and what it means that's the kind of thing that our churches need now again stories are okay stories are great i tell stories from time to time when i'm when i'm preaching from the pulpit i'm not saying i'm not anti-story but i think that for some people there's this whole thing of well people relate more to stories so they they they're very story heavy they're they're heavy on story and then they give a few a, a little bit of attention to you know what scripture says here and so they you know they might mention something here and there okay now and now let me tell you 50 billion stories um i i don't think i don't think that's healthy for the church okay and so we really need people who are solid in teaching what the what scripture says and listen script what it says and what it actually means okay and when and when people do that when they're dedicated to that um, I believe that, that that plays in big to the whole thing of of of, of caring for um, c- caring for the flock. Okay, and the second element uh, that, and again, I draw this from scripture. These aren't things that I'm just making up, but as, but the second thing, and I'll I'll turn to this here. Um, you see in in uh, first uh, first Peter chapter five. Now Peter is 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 giving this as somebody who is a. Um, uh, who is a, a fellow elder himself? He identifies himself as such. But if you notice in First Peter chapter five, the very beginning, he says um, in that chapter at the very beginning of that chapter, he says, "So I exhort the elders among you, as fellow as a as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight." Okay, overseeing the flock, not under compulsion, but w- but willingly, as God would have you, um, not for shameful gain, but eager, uh, but eagerly, not domineering, not not domineering over those in your charge, but listen to this. This is where I want to hone it. But being examples to the flock. So we want people in those positions who 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 teach and preach. And who are, I mean, within the eldership, if people are called to that whole thing of teaching and preaching and everything like that, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's what we're looking for. Somebody who is able to, able to teach and also who, uh, who is, is, is an example. And so when you do those things, um, you know, it's, it, it kind of even goes along the lines. I, I want to, and again, certain things are just coming to me as I'm, as I'm saying these things. Um, um, in first Timothy, again, if you go back to the pastorals and you look at, uh, first Timothy chapter four, um, 
Well, I'm going to let me let me start in verse 11 there. I mean, but there's a there's a particular place within that passage I want to hone in on um, in verse 11. Where it says command and teach these things. Let no one despise uh, despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example. There it is. Set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. So you see those two things kind of put together there in those few verses uh, that we talked about there. Do not neglect, this is verse 14, do not neglect the gift we, the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that, so that all may see your progress. And I think that 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 uh, that that goes into the whole thing of examples as well, so that so that people can see your progress. Verse sixteen: Keep a close watch on your. Now listen: Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. So there's that whole thing of element of of keeping watch on yourself, just as we saw there in Acts chapter twenty, uh, as we saw in Acts chapter twenty. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. So you see the dual aspect of there, of watching over yourself, saving yourself, and also with, with the hearers that are that are under the sound of your voice. And so that's what you that's what you have going on there. So preaching, teaching, reading scripture, and being an example. I think that that's mainly what goes into the whole thing of um, of uh, being uh, of looking over over the flock. And so he says, in, so we're back in, in, uh, in Acts chapter 20, he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock. Um, in, in, now, here we go as we, as we go further, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now, the one thing that I want to point out here is that this is something that is, that is a, this is a divine appointment. The whole thing of, this, of, this, of, of people in this position is something that is, that is divinely determined, Okay. And it's the Holy Spirit, he says, the Holy Spirit is the one who is who has set you in this position. Um, you know, this is this is more than just listen, if we're talking about somebody who is truly called to ministry, um, and we're talking about somebody who's maybe looking for a church to pastor or something like that, you might have you have a, a search committee who looks through thousands of resumes and things like that. But, you know, when somebody is brought on or quote unquote hired, which I hate that word when it, when it comes to uh, the pastorate, but you know, that's, that's kind of how we look at things now. Somebody hired onto, uh, onto the, onto staff to be a, to be lead pastor of a church somewhere. Um, you know, the whole thing is if all of this is, is according to God's will and it's, and it's, and it's following the uh, God's course of that particular person's life. Ultimately, what we're dealing with is a divine determination of, of that person being with that congregation. Yes, the the search committee hired them. Yes, you know the the congregation gave their may have given their approval after the after uh, after the person candidated with them. You know, but you know ultimately what we're talking about is somebody who's called to ministry and called to minister to particular people. That's a divine. That's a that's a divine determination. And so what we see here, again, he says, um, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The Holy Spirit has made you into this. Okay. And so because of that, this is something that you need to take very seriously. Okay. Um, and he's, listen, by the way, he's the one that you answer to, right? Um, in, in first Peter chapter five, you remember I read from first Peter chapter five, it didn't read further, but when you read further, the thing that the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as he's referred to as the chief shepherd. So even as a shepherd of a particular congregation, you yourself are not the chief shepherd. You have another chief shepherd. You have another shepherd looking over, uh, watching over what you're doing. He is the chief shepherd. Okay. And I think some people forget that sometimes some, uh, you know, both in the lady and within the, within the, within the pastorate is that uh, you are not, if you're a lead pastor, you are not top cheese. I mean, from a human perspective, that might be the case, but really, you know, technically speaking, you are not the lead pastor. <laughs> you are not the, the lead shepherd. The lead shepherd is the head of the church who is Jesus Christ himself. That's why Peter can call him the chief shepherd, right? And so, you know, when you, so when you look at it for, through that lens, it, I think it kind of changes your, your thinking a little bit. Um, 
who has made you overseers to do what? It says to care for the church of God. All right, that's what that's what he's supposed to do. He's, he's supposed to take care of the church of God. Now, I've, I've talked a little bit about what uh, what all that might look like. The whole thing of 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 teaching, um, preaching, and being an, exa- an example to uh, an example to the flock. Those things that you can flesh out from Scripture, right? Um, you know of what that might look like. So, you know, we don't have to go into 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 anything there. But take note of that word to care for to care for uh, to m- in my mind and taking that and then in, in combination to just a lot of the other things that we've, you know, that we've already talked about up to this point. I hope you, I hope just by that you're able to see how, you know, how personal this, this sort of thing is and how, when you take something like that compared to, okay, um, the pastor is responsible for running all of these different programs you understand how discombobulated that sort of perspective really is. You know, when it com- when it comes to when it comes to leading the church, the pastor, elders and and things, they are not programmers. They're not supposed to be. Their their main concern isn't isn't supposed to be okay starting different programs, running different programs and under- overseeing these different programs, just program 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 program. It, it, it's it's leading a church is not running programs and listen somebody explained this to me years ago he said look you have to understand is yeah, somebody going into the ministry you're 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 going to be looked at as one who 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 sets up programs and runs programs and, and just as he was explaining this to me i'm just kind of my stomach just inwardly turned i'm like ugh, i don't want to i don't want to run programs now if the lord leads you to run a program that's connected to to being a shepherd to the flock maybe maybe that's another thing but i don't think that's how a lot of people look at it today it, it, it's 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 much more to that in a lot of people's eyes. So it's it's just a matter of putting people together, uh, running running it as an organization, bringing people together, and then evaluating the success of it based on how many people came to your program or came to this program or that program, and the pro and the results of the programs are an end in themselves, which I think isn't necessarily very accurate either. Um. There's folks, there's a lot there. It, there's more to this whole thing of being a pastor than just running programs. In fact, if if somebody were to stand up and to say and 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 start a revolution where they were saying, I want to start a revolution where pastors withdraw themselves from the um, from the from the organization of programs. I'm going to be one who says, OK, I'm I'm, I'm with you on that. Can I run that revolution with you? Because it's because the 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 whole thing of 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 pastors and elders for a lot of Christians has been reduced to this whole thing of they're just people who run programs. And again, like I said, I I was I remember I sat down with somebody face to face. This was years ago, and explaining my whole thing of wanting to go into the ministry. Well, you have to understand that going into ministry and being a pastor, you know, requires this, this, and this, and running programs, and 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 starting programs and overseeing programs. And I was like. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. And I don't think that that's really what it's supposed to be. But if that's what's being explained to me, that, that tells you that that's really where a lot of churches are today. The question is, the question is, is, are the pastors and the elders, are they, are they caring for the flock? And the care is a spiritual care. It's a soul care. You are looking out for the souls of other people and protecting them. As you see, as the, as the passage goes on, it's, 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 it, you know, it, it's more than just this teaching and preaching and everything like that. A lot of it is involved in that, but it also it, it involves protecting them as well. If we're using the whole picture of, of, of a, a, a shepherd, a shepherd is one who protects the flock as well. And particularly what that looks like is, it, is protecting them from that which is false. Um, what what uh, Paul would use here is the, the term of, of fierce of fierce wolves. Um, so as we as we continue on here um, in uh, listen, still in verse <laughs> still in verse 28. I told you there's a lot in verse 28. That last part there it says which he obtained with his own blood. Now, some manuscripts will will acknowledge um, in um, the whole thing um, where in verse 28, where it, says, it talks about the church of God, some manuscripts do say church of Christ, because Christ was the only one who was incarnated and one who was able to sh- who shed his own blood. 
and nothing here is to suggest that the father is the son and so forth and, and going into a system of modalism here. But I think from the reader's perspective, we are to understand, of course, we know that Jesus Christ himself is God, right? So we're not saying anything false at all here. Um, but with in view of Christ, who again, as we understand and as we acknowledge is the head of the church, the church belongs to him and everything having to do with the church and the outworking of the church is a part of Christ's whole dealio there. You, you can read that in Ephesians chapter one. In Ephesians chapter one, it's made pretty clear that Christ is the head of the church and that he's in charge of everything over the church. So when we look at this whole thing of, of which he obtained with his own blood, we come to understand the value of, of the church in God's eyes just by the purchase price of it. Not, not purchased with silver or gold or with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, as Peter says in 1 Peter, I believe it's chapter 1. Okay, that, that ups the game here a little bit. So if you're a pastor, if you're an elder, or somebody like myself, I look at this and I say that this is something that, that makes me understand all the more how seriously I have to take this. Because the purchase that was made for the church was not cheap. It was not cheap. It was very, very costly. It, was, it cost the son's own blood. He shed his own blood to purchase the church. That gives you an understanding of the value of the church that is now God's possession, who is now part of Christ's possession. And so if, 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 if pastors and leaders are being entrusted with a flock, we have to just think of it like this. If somebody puts something that's very valuable under your care, you're going to be very careful to look after it and watch over it. We can even use the human realm. I mean, you don't have to look at anything materially, but I mean, even in its most basic form, if you're, if, if you, uh, if anybody out there is listening has ever babysat before, you're looking after somebody else's kid, somebody else's offspring. Listen, that's no, that's no big thing. That that's, excuse me, that's no small thing. You know, somebody is entrusting into your care a couple of, uh, a couple or a few uh, little, little ones that don't belong to you but they're very valuable and very precious to the parents who have entrusted them into your care, right? So um, given that, given that you are entr- they've been entrusted into your care, these kids who don't belong to you, but are very valuable and very precious. If we're talking about a normal parent, we're not talking about scumbag parents. We're not talking about neglectful parents. We're not talking about, um, we're not uh, talking about uh, abandoning parents or anything like that. If we're talking about the normal attitude of a parent who, who loves their children so much, pe- you were talking about people who I wouldn't doubt would, 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 would give their lives for their children if it ever came to that. And now they're being trust entrusted into your care if you're in that babysitting role. Given that, you're not going to do things um, or or allow things um, for that uh, that uh, for that child to do that would be harmful to them. Heck, if they're there, if they're your own kids, you wouldn't allow that to happen with your own kids. You wouldn't treat them carelessly. So even thinking about about somebody else, you know, just somebody entrusting somebody else's kids into your care. Um, you're going to be just as careful. You're not going to allow them to do things around the house that are that are dangerous and could harm. That could cause serious harm or maybe even death. You're going to watch over them. You're going to protect them. That's why you're there, pretty much, essentially, if you want to get down to it, to protect them. Because if we're talking about kids who are who are not old enough to look after themselves or to be left home alone, um, you know they they need somebody to watch over them, so they need somebody to protect them. So that they don't hurt themselves or they don't kill themselves, right? You're not going to leave a toddler or a three-year-old or a two-year-old, you know, whatever at home alone while, while you go out. You're going to hire a babysitter to look after them so that they don't kill themselves or hurt themselves, right? That's, that's what you have. Now, you think about that in the spiritual realm and you think about the church and you think about Christ and Christ is saying, these are mine. Now, of course... The elders, the pastors, we belong to Christ as well. So it's not like we're on the outside of that whole thing. But if we're talking about the care of something or a group of people, these are people who belong to Christ and they were purchased with Christ's own blood. We understand the costliness of that. So if we really want to, if we really want to put perspective on this, this is, this is a serious matter here and it needs to be taken seriously. 
because they belong to they belong to God. They belong to God. This is the care of the church of God, which again, using that term church, whether you want to use church of God, whether you want to use church of Christ, you know, whatever. Um, the thing is, is that, um, it, and again, I'm speaking to you if you're a pastor or an elder or, or whatever, is that you're dealing with, you're, you're not dealing with that, which is your own. And you have to be very careful of that as well. Having this perspective of this is my flock. This is my congregation. This is what I'm going to do with my, with my group. This is what I'm going to do with my congregation. No, it does not belong to you. This is the church of God. This is the church of Christ. They've been entrusted to you. And this is a valuable lot. You know why? Because they were purchased with Christ's own blood. Okay, so you're not going to treat this whole thing haphazardly and be lackadaisical about these things. You are going to be one who um, who, who takes this thing very seriously once you see that from that perspective. So it's very important to to put yourself in your own pl- in in your own place as well, understanding what your place is in this whole thing. You know, somebody uh, when they when they when they found out about my pursuit of ministry and everything, um, this person had said to me, "Oh, so you so you want to have your own church?" And I and I think I know what she meant. I mean, I'm not I, you know I'm not going to take her too literally or whatever, but it's just the way that it was said. Where it's just kind of like, oh no, ugh, ugh, no, that the the words that came out of my, her mouth kind of rubbed me the wrong way, not in an offensive way. It's just kind of just what I understand things biblically to be. So you want to have your own church, huh? Actually, no, I don't want to have my own church. Um, I want to be one who is found trustworthy enough to be entrusted with uh, the flock that that God cares for through the Son of uh, through His Son Jesus Christ to be put into my care and to be in that position to shepherd God's flock. That's, that's really what I want. It, it, the whole thing of, do you want to have your own church? I mean, again, I don't want to be, be too technical with words here. You, well, you know what she meant and everything. Yeah, I do. But it's just the way that it sounds though. It just kind of gives me the spiritual heebie jeebies. Uh, you want to, you want to have your own church, huh? No, no. No, because that, that that doesn't belong to me. It's not my own church. It's Christ's church. It belongs to him. And I pray to, I better take that pretty darn seriously, um, which I do, which I do. Um, so that, listen, that all, <laughs> that was all verse 28. Okay. And here's, you know what? Here's here's what I'm going to do because if I continue to go on this, is it's going to be a super long episode, and I really don't want to make it into that. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to leave it there, okay? And we're going to continue. Now we're going to continue on through what I intended to get through this time, and and um, try and finish up what I what I was going to was what I was going to cover the time after that. So in other words, we're going to try and finish up chapter, still stick to our schedule of finishing up chapter 20 next time. Um, maybe the most of my, the bulk of what I was going to say has been said already. And it just covers that verse of, of verse 28. So, um, you know, in our study of the book of Acts, whenever we've covered one verse, we've only, that's only happened twice. Um, that happened when we looked at chapter nine, verse 31, um, and we did a two-parter on that. And then chapter 13, verse 48, we did a two-parter on that. Um, but those were planned. I didn't plan to just cover verse 28 and then just leave it at that. So, But I think that's what I want to do. We'll just leave it there, and then we'll try and finish up everything um, with chapter 20 next time. Now, given what's happened now and what's given, what's happened here, am I going to make promises that, that's what, that, that we're going to finish chapter 20 next time? No, I'll be a little bit more careful and, than that, and I won't make any promises. But that's what we'll try and do. We'll see what the Lord unfolds um, as we as we go about that. Okay, so we will leave it there. Take some time to to chew on that and to consider that, um, so that you'll be prepared, be prepared for the continuation of our discussion of this next time as we venture into verse twenty nine and following. Okay, so if you enjoyed this discussion and if you enjoy the show all, all together all around, and if you want to uh, hear more um, and uh, you know just be notified of things down the road, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show for free on iTunes and also on Google Play. It's av- available there. Um, also check me uh, check out Loving the Scriptures on um, on uh, excuse me on Twitter. <laughs> 
on Twitter. On Twitter, okay, the handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S E R I P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. All right. I've enjoyed my time with you. I always do. Um, like I said, we'll try and fi- try and finish up chapter 20 next time. We'll see if we actually do that next time or not. Um, but whatever the case may be, I anticipate that it'll be uh, that it'll be a good discussion. So I hope you got a lot out of this, whether you're a pastor or whether you're a lay person. Uh, I hope that this is is valuable for you. And so it gives you something to think about and meditate on. OK, so my name is Steve Gill, and I hope to see you right back here next time. Bye now.